makes you look foolish when the microphone's not on and you start to talk. Anyway, well, we're going to kick this off. Um, we are the Hacker Pimps. Um, we have a few members, but only three of us decided to show up. So it makes the presentation uh, very interesting. Um, I'm Sisman. This is Qui-Gon. This is Skydog. And what we're going to talk about today is some wireless mischief. Um, it's kind of like a wireless panel, but we're going to be all over the place with this stuff, so uh, hopefully you get some, some good information out of it. Um, one thing I want to do uh, before we start is I have a gift to give uh, to Skydog. He kind of hooked us up uh, when we were out at TourCon speaking. So if you can see, they didn't make uh, TourCon shirts an extra fat ass, so we had, to <laughs> we had to get him something that was in that size. And it says, I saw some males wearing this too, it says, Network Administrators Eat Babies, and then on the back there's a DD command, if dev baby, um, output file, root mouth. So uh, he can go ahead and have that now. <laughs> Um, as usual, our doc <laughs> as usual, our documents are never current because um, you know we usually finish them like five minutes before we present, or we're usually freaking out because some tool we created uh, isn't working. Um, so hit the site, Hacker Pimps Docs. So this is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about uh, the Wi-Fi race that was held, which is ran by Skydog. Uh, we're going to talk about um, <laughs> what we did last year. Um, to totally hose the race. And that's They went with a little bit different model this year. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about WPA 802.11i, and um, we're going to talk about um, Feruza WRT, our custom firmware. The reason for this presentation is we wanted to talk about both the Wi-Fi race and all the mischief, but that would only take... God, I mean, what, 10 minutes to goof around about that? So we had to like talk about something with more substance. So we wanted to, to show some people some more advanced you know, wireless protection mechanisms. Now, some of this may be like way beneath your knowledge level, um, but from some of the current wireless trends, people aren't using this stuff. So it's kind of hard to tell where people are sitting with regard to wireless knowledge. And then, of course, we want to we wanna pimp our uh, custom firmware. Um, then I'll turn it over to Skydog. Hi everyone, how you doing? I'm Skydog. I'm the uh, the guy that actually sponsored the Wi-Fi race last year. Uh, wi race.com is my domain. Uh, dude, later on we'll do that. Okay, quit. Anyway, um, thank you, John. Uh, so I own Wi-Fi race.com. I got the idea that uh, it would be really nice to uh, set up a nice you know, race around Nashville, so we got together with a couple of people and we kind of bounced it around. Last year's uh, setup was to search APs in a given area. The team that actually went out and found the most access points in the shortest period of time won. Um, find the drugs. Well, when you're sitting around and uh, Ice Knife is talking to you and you go, well, what are we going to use for access point names? I don't know why he came up with pharmaceuticals, but that's what we used. It was Prozac and things of that nature. So uh, we set all the access points up as far as set up an execution. Um, we set all the access points up inside the inner perimeter of the interstates around Nashville. This is I-40 and I-65. Uh, I believe it's like 11 square miles inside that area. Um, you don't really want to hang out on this part of town or on this part of town, but we're over in this area. It's not too bad. Uh, basically, we, we found a lot of businesses that were really cool and said, yeah, you can put an access point here. Uh, we did a lot of different configurations. Uh, some of them were open. Some of them were secured. Nothing was actually attached to a network, so it's not like anything was going to get majorly hacked. But uh, this is the kind of the, the, the basic setup we had. Uh, we advertised that there were 10 access points. The interesting part was there were not. Uh, I believe there were only eight that were actually put out. Um, we did have someone say that they found all of the access points, which I get to point a finger and go, guess what, you're a liar, because it just wouldn't happen that way. Uh, we had some of them actually, um, probably these guys, 
went in and hacked and changed a lot of the information, so it worked out really well. Uh, this year's uh, Wi-Fi race was fox and hound style, which um, tonight before the costuming will announce the winner of that. But um, last year, Goat, I'm trying to think who all won that, Goat, Hobbs, and Sasquatch, I believe, uh, I don't know, turned into winning entries, basically. I think they found three access points. What I didn't know was these guys went out and dominated everything. So I'm going to hand it back to Nate. He's going to tell me all the things I didn't hear yet. Okay. Um, last year, we, did, we didn't uh, really let on uh, our plans for the Wi-Fi race. There was this wireless contest, and, and uh, Qui-Gon says, hey, man, we should, we should really, um, you know, go out there and, and try to win that thing. And we got to kicking it around, and we were like, wouldn't it be funnier just to, like, mess it up for everyone? So that's what we decided to do. That's what we wanted to accomplish was to make people think they thought they won, even though they really didn't. That's why some people probably may have found all the access points, but they may have been driving around the city mobile. So what we did was is we took a couple of WRTs and put them in one car, programmed them with the access point names, sent them out. Then we had another one that we set up, another car that ran in a different direction that was running fake AP with not only some of the proper names, but also some ones like Fuck Your Mother and all this other stuff. So we put those ones in there, and we just let them run around. Some of the most obscure names you could think of, just nasty stuff. And we mixed those in with them and kind of drove around the city. And we were, like, watching people, like, running, like, either Net Stumbler or something. You'd see it come up on, on Kismet where it would say, you know, hey, somebody's trying to, uh, you know, somebody's running in promiscuous mode. So that's what we did. Um, some of the tools that could help are obviously, you know, fake AP. And, you know, if you have a good WRT, preferably running for Rosa, so you could probably run the fake AP program that doesn't work <laughs> yet. Okay, now we're going to turn it over to um, some wireless trends that, uh, that are happening in the business right now. I haven't been in a business, I'm a security consultant, and I haven't been in a business yet that's actually using WPA for anything, even though their access points and their clients pretty much support it. Everybody's either not using anything, they either don't know they have wireless in their establishments, or they're running web. For some reason, they think they need to have backwards compatibility for something, which they really don't. Um, in the recent past, people you know, just didn't see wireless as that big of a threat. Um, currently, people are like, oh man, I, don't want, I either don't want wireless in my organization, or... You know, I want to do it right, but I really don't know how. And in the future, who knows? I mean, everything seems to be going wireless in one way, shape, or form. New standards are coming out, and people are making new products, and it's becoming cheaper. Um, usability is going to win out over security. So it's going to continue to evolve. Um, <laughs> we're not going <laughs> to we're not going to turn this into a uh, uh, a talk on web. We're not going to discuss it. That is definitely a dead horse, and everybody who talks um, about wireless most of the time talks about web. So I'm sure you've heard this, um, if not at this con, at some other con somewhere. People covered it a lot better than, uh, than we're going to even, no, I'm going to talk about it. Okay, turn it over to Qui-Gon. Okay, the first thing we're going to do here is a WPA overview. Uh, it stands for Wi-Fi Protected Access. Uh, there's two types. There's uh, WPA Personal where you basically use pre-shared keys, also known as WPA, PSK. And then you've got WPA Enterprise, which uses extensible authentication protocol, um, basically like a radius server such as Free Radius. Um, WPA, WPA uses TKIP for encryption over WEP. Uh, it's Temporal Key Integrity Protocol. Uh, TKIP was created to address some of the weaknesses of WEP uh, without having to do a hardware upgrade. Uh, it adds me message integrity, um, the initialization vector selection, um, and it can be reused. Um, and the IV doubles as a replay counter. Uh, the IV space is increased to 48 bits, and uh, you get per packet key mixing. Basically, so some of those were obviously web weaknesses. Um, it really didn't have any any kind of message integrity or any kind of thing to stop replays. So that's how you could accelerate some of the cracking of web. But 
the, the, I, the IV, the actual initialization vector, actually starts and then increments by one. So instead of like you know running all over the space, it acts as it's able to act as a replay counter. And in the per packet key mixing is basically the the rotation of the key on a per frame basis. Okay, uh, 802.11i is is the uh, the new quote unquote be all end all security protocol. And everybody is ranting and raving and how great it's going to be. Well, maybe. Only time will tell. I mean, once it gets out there and it's in wide use and a lot of other people start looking at it, there may be some obvious uh, vulnerabilities. I mean, it's not like, the, you know, the, the wireless people designing these standards are, are actually have a good batting average at this stuff. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on. You can tell we're really prepared for this, aren't right? Um, anyway, you have a, two different types of networks with 802.11i. You have a TSN, which is Transitional Security Network, and RSN, which is Robust Security Network. All that means is, is transitional means you're in the, in the process of transitioning off of web-based systems so that you can coexist. Robust is a full 802.11i, or full, yeah, full 802.11i network. Now, AES CCMP is what's used as the protection mechanism in this is really long. Advanced encryption standard, counter mode, cipher blockchaining, message authentication code protocol is what that stands for. And basically all that does is it defines how AES is implemented into the protocol. Because AES by itself is just, you know, an, is just a cipher. Okay, so you've got WPA, you've got basically a server side and a client side. Um, using the client side Windows XP, um, use the Windows Wireless Zero configuration, uh, set the ISIS ID and the properties, uh, set the network authentication to WPA PSK or WPA radius, um, set the encryption to TKIP, and then type in your password twice. I mean, really pretty simple, and nobody's using it. Uh, for Nix, it gets a little hairy, but... Um, Linux and BSD, you have um, uh, the supplicant. Uh, it does WPA, full 802.11i, RSN, WPA2. Um, you can get it at this address. Also runs on Windows. Um, you have both a command line and a GUI setup. Um, sports both PSK and EEP. Um, requires 2.4 or 2.6 kernel. Or FreeBSD 6 current or NetBSD current. Um, this is only about half of the list of what the WPA supplicant supports. That's, that's for, uh, oops. Sorry, it works better when I have the microphone. This is just the EAP types that it supports. For if you're if you're using like the supplicant actually supports WEP, it supports different 802.1x types, it supports you know just standard open configuration, whatever, however you want to set it up. Um, supported cards, supported drivers, uh, host AP for the Prism cards, uh, the Linux Ant driver loader, uh, a Gear Systems Linux driver. Um, the last two support WPA, but not WPA2. Uh, the Mad Wi-Fi drivers, uh, the Atmel, uh, NIDS wrapper, uh, Broadcom WL.0, which is the chipset that the WRT uses, uh, the Intel IP. IPW 2100, 2200, and the NetBSD, or the BSD Net 802.11 layer, and the Windows NDIS drivers. Um, since I run a Debian-based system, I did app get installed WPA supplicant, and then ran this command to get it to run. Uh, the TACD on the end is, if you put a TACD on the end, it, you can do debugging. Um, the TAC C is where the configuration file is, and the TAC B basically turns it into a daemon. And here's a basic config file. This does a pre-shared key for WPA. Um, it allows members of the wheel group to control the supplicant, uh, scans for SSIDs, assigns the PSK to, to, as the authentication protocol, uh, delivers a passphrase to the WAP, 
And there are so many different combinations you can use with this thing, it's not even funny. It's very powerful. I guess I could quit reaching all the time. <laughs> Uh, WPA client side on Mac OS X, uh, you need Panther or better, uh, considering Tiger is the, the current release. Um, you probably shouldn't be running Jaguar anymore anyway. Uh, enable the radio, connect to the AP. Operating system automatically detects that you're using uh, WPA on the AP. Type in your passphrase and you're done. Um, server side, most of your newer WAPs support WPA out of the box. Um, some of your older WAPs, you might be able to get a firmware upgrade for them. Um, some manufacturers even build in uh, external radius authentication. Um, just hit Google. So that, that kind of covers, I guess I'll step back over here. That kind of covers um, using something such as WPA uh, for your home or you know, business. Obviously, one thing we, we uh, failed to mention in the slides that I just noticed is if you are using WPA with pre-shared key, um, make sure that it's a very strong uh, passphrase because other, there's tools out there to crack the WPA PSK and do you know, dictionary or brute force attacks on it. Yeah, like 25 characters and, you know, upper, lowercase, you know, the standard strong passphrase. So now when you're away from home, because it happens with a lot of us, especially if you're traveling to places where people have been known to be nefarious on the wireless network, it's probably pretty important that um, that's most likely the place where you're going to be attacked uh, as far as, you know, your credentials and things like that, because people like to, you know, mess around. So don't forget about you know just going to Starbucks and sitting down and just firing up your laptop. Sorry if we're speaking underneath a lot of people. We're just throwing it out there. So don't let people get your credentials and don't use unprotected protocols. I mean, that seems pretty self-explanatory. Um, use an encrypted tunnel of some type. You know, OpenVPN is a great tool. You can tunnel using SSH. Use things like that and preferably something that wouldn't be vulnerable to a man-in-the-middle attack. Well, it depends on what you're trying to do with it. I mean, if you're trying to use um, multiple protocols, like say if you're trying to surf the web and use, you know, AIM, and then you're trying to use, um, you know, send mail and things like that, it's probably better just to run a VPN or, you know, configure a proxy and use SSH. So in our usual fashion, uh, we are going extremely fast. So does anybody have any questions before we get into Feruza? Yeah, WPA, the pre-share key, yeah. No, you wouldn't, yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't really need that because as soon as somebody associates with that AP, it's going to, I mean, Kismet's going to pull that up. Um, yeah, so no, I, I, not that I'm aware of, but usually if there's an AP around, then somebody's going to be using it, especially if it's like a business. I mean, hiding the SSID really doesn't do anything. I mean, any knowledgeable person who's going to target that particular wireless network, I mean, that's just, you know, obfuscation of the SSID. And... You know, Kismet will find that just fine as soon as somebody associates with that AP. Any other questions? And I'm sorry for the people watching on TV. I forgot to uh, repeat that question. I will not make that mistake again. Otherwise, you can throw plastic bottles at me. <laughs> now I see everybody trying to cock back. Okay, we're going to move on. Uh, we're going to talk about Fruza WRT. Perusa WRT is a custom-built firmware for the Linksys WRT54GS. It may run on a G, but uh, we didn't have any that we could sacrifice to uh, test that with. Um, basically, what it is is it's, it's built on 
it started out with OpenWRT, and we built in some things that, that, that we thought it really needed, like exploits and uh, things like that. Fun stuff. Um, it used to be called Foxer, um, but uh, I guess, you know, if you're, if you're speaking with your boss about it, it's like, hey, you know, I developed this thing called Foxer. You know, we've been messing around with it. So, yeah, we decided to change it to Feruza uh, uh, because we're obsessed. I'll step to the side. Okay, so what we built into Feruza WRT, um, IPv6 support out of the box, uh, complete with IP tables firewalling, uh, CF CIFS for mounting 2K, XP, Vista, or whatever the hell they're calling it now, shares. Um, NFS client support, including swap over NFS, um, file system over SSH, uh, and NBT scan for uh, scanning Windows shares, DSNF, NMAP, HPing2, Hydra, uh, some cross-compiled uh, proof-of-concept exploits, including MS05039, which is the last one that I had heard of, and um, Feruza US. I think we'll, we'll we'll run through this a little bit. It's real it's real easy to install software with this. It's it uses iPackage. So if you're familiar with like the Debian system, it's it's basically like apt-get. You do an, you do an iPackage update to update the packages. iPackage install package name and an iPackage remove package name. But it comes default with the HackerPimps repository that we have, which has some extra things that that uh, you know we've we've made available. Okay, now we can get to some of the fun stuff. Um, Feruza US, um, this is basically done to make it a little bit easier to use rather than just, you know, and we've, we've um, found that uh, some people really shouldn't be running our firmware. Uh, you know, some of the questions you get when you release a tool of some type, like people will say, hey, I have problems. Some of them are legit. Like w when we first released it, we forgot to tell people how to log into it. It was like the simplest thing that you forget. So that was a very, even though it was a very idiotic question, it was very, man it was, I could definitely see that. We had it nowhere in the readme. Hey, this is how you log into this thing. If they would have ran Nmap, they'd have said, oh, wow, that's how you log in. But... Well, we, we fixed that in the README, and uh, this is basically a tool to help you do things uh, a little easier by using less keystrokes, or you don't have to know which NVRAM variables to set on certain things. If you want to change the SSID or do something of that nature, the like port scan. And what, it, what it's starting to be designed to do is to make it more like, so you can set a host, set a target network, and then run things on that target network without having to keep specifying things over and over again. Um, Feruza US is used to configure the WRT. Uh, it eases uh, simple recon tasks. It's quick. It's fast. Um, and you don't have to remember things like NVRAM set this, that. Uh, for net recon, uh, you can use NMAP or NETCAT to, you know, NETCAT's not the best port scanner. Uh, it's not really what it was made to do, but with NMAP in there, most people wouldn't wouldn't uh, use netcat for that anyway but here's some syntax for using you know netcat and we don't i don't think we really need to go through the syntax for nmap there's a lot of different options for doing net bios recon um, there we have nbt scan in there which will give you some some useful information uh, what we wanted to do is to create a, a proof of concept box. And a WRT is something that everybody is used to seeing. I mean, you see them, they, they sell them at Best Buy. Somebody's probably brought one into work before. It's something that looks innocuous, but it's really not. I mean, this thing, if you plug it into a network, you have a pretty good suite of tools to sit there and, you know, run attacks on machines. Um, here's NBT scan in action. You know, it just shows you... I guess I named a box called owned. Yeah. Yeah, owned. Uh, just default work group. And this is something that you can scare your clients with because they probably have one at their house. Um, mounting shares. Uh, there's some syntax for mounting shares. You can also mount these through the Fruzy US interface. Sorry if I'm standing in people's way. Um, but you can mount things over the net. That's kind of fun. That could be interesting. We're not trying to put ideas in anybody's heads because in, I'm telling you, if you do something really nasty with this, don't email us 
and tell us, hey, guess what I did with this? Uh, we don't want to know. <laughs> um, you grab files, input files. And here is some, uh, here is basically a mounted uh, share with MP3s, prawn, and wares. I know it's probably, it, it would, it would, yes, your box. And uh, <laughs> it would be a lot more funny if you could read this. It really would. Um, the reason you'd want to mount is because um, some of the slides that we didn't put in here are the amount of RAM that the WRT has, um, you know, whether it's a G or a GS, um, you're going to want some extra room, especially if you're, if you're using Hydra to, um, you know, run a, a login attack against something, you're going to need a, a place for your dictionary file. So you might want to do that. You may want to grab files, put files. Um, it helps when you're trying to crack web because you've got to collect all the IVs. Um, helps when you need to look. I already repeated that. That's what I get for not looking there. Uh, helps when you want to save some files from someplace. Notice how vague some of these descriptions are. <laughs> we just want to be vague, and you can use your imagination to um, completely go nuts. Yes. Oh, I thought you were, you were waving to somebody else, and obviously not to me. Wireless recon. Um, you can use Kismet. There, there's full Kismet servers available for it. Kismet drone. Um, it helps if you want to mess with um, SkyDog's Wi-Fi race. Uh, <laughs> um, you can crack web with it. Although there's um, there's an issue we we haven't figured out quite why something's happening. Like one of the versions, um, AirCrack worked just fine, and then something happened. I don't know if it was a driver issue or they keep um, Cisco since they bought uh, Linksys keeps messing with the versions of the WRT and the version 5.0 if you go to Best Buy or something and you get a version 5.0 it is not running Linux anymore so take it back I mean take it back and make them take it back because if people buy them and figure out that they can't mess with them and take them back it actually comes back to Cisco you know because they're already reporting a large amount of returns on these things because people buy them because they want to customize them and they can't do that anymore um, if you're, you know, looking to do uh, password sniffing, um, dsniff is built into it. Um, <laughs> Hydra, you can use uh, Hydra. Again, very vague, very vague. Um, owned by phone, th yeah, I know my camera sucks. It takes an already blurry picture and makes it even more blurry. Um, but what that is is that's the splash screen uh, for Feruza right there. And... Um, what you can do is you can impress your friends at parties with this. Um, you can actually own machines using your, uh, using your cell phone. So it's pretty neat. You just basically manage Feruza remotely with yourself like an SSH-enabled cell phone. And this picture, although it's a little bit clearer, um, you, you can't tell, but it says see Windows System 32 at the bottom. So I actually had um, SkyDog's machine owned with uh, – no, I'm kidding um, – with Feruza US. <laughs> and we found out that his prawn can, all has donkeys in it for some reason. I'm not quite sure what that's all about. Um, drive by upload. This can become an issue if people just don't change the admin password on their, their WRTs. Or um, iDefense came out with, uh, I forget the name of the vulnerability. Um, I forget the actual iDefense lab advisory that came out. But basically what it was was you can upload arbitrary firmware without having the credentials. That's very bad, especially with, with this. So if somebody were to drive by and upload a new, this new firmware, for one, the people using it wouldn't even know. It's going to inherit all the settings from the previous install. So, uh, yeah, that's not good. Um, and, of course, this window looks familiar, um, but that's what you get. Uh, warning. There should be a different warning on there. Uh, but we'll leave that to the imagination as well. Okay, drive-by upload, used to recon external systems, internal systems, pretty much anything that that particular WRT would have access to, um, you can look at it. Um, Feruza fake AP, this is a sore subject with me personally because there's a problem with, um, with the, the way the Broadcom driver is called, and uh, although it's... It's working. It doesn't change channels. So we decided not to include it in the current release of Feruza, uh, Feruza WRT because it's pretty pointless. It's pretty obvious what you're doing when it never changes channels. 
So it does everything but change channels. So it's, it's like, ah, somebody's running a fake AP program. So, yeah, hopefully that will be fixed soon. Uh, we're still trying to troubleshoot that. All right, malicious VPN. Um, this this is something that, that you can do if you if you actually put uh, this firmware in an organization. You can actually have it connect back to a machine. Uh, Open VPN is is very easy to configure. And if you drop this somewhere, like say say you're doing a pen test and you you basically go into an organization, either you social engineer your way in, you do a drive by upload, you deploy it and it will actually create a client connection back to a server. Now it's encrypted, it's tunneled, and IDSs won't see it. So if you were to like uh, use commonly open ports such as 80, 443, 22, UDP 53, things like that, you can actually get around a lot of filtering mechanisms and get around a lot of things that are designed to detect uh, malicious behavior. Um, OpenVPN will work behind a NAT, which is very cool. Um, it can use pre-shared keys or digital certificates, though, although uh, if you were using this for a pen test or some sort of malicious purpose, I don't know why you'd give it one of your valid certificates. Kind of stupid, but um, if that's your pleasure, uh, IDS evasion, and you can have somebody else's network actually connect to you. Um, static key open VPN. This is really boring, so I'm sorry. Um, but it's very easy to configure, sets up quickly, and um, you can use it. You can use the same key on your entire army of uh, WRTs. Um, you, to generate a key, um, open VPN, gen key, secret, static dot key, and use both keys on the client and the server. If you're going to use open VPN for your own purposes, I'd suggest going the digital certificate route. But and uh, also too, like going back to protecting your access while away, you can actually use an uh, WRT, run open VPN on it, and tunnel home every time you go to a conference and surf without being heckled too bad. Just make sure you um, do certificate verification or some mailman in the middle of you. Pretty basic open VPN server config, port 53, dev ton, mode server, if that's just the point-to-point the, the -point link secret. And then the client, oops. I'm not going back to that slide, not like you care anyway. You can tell, you can tell that every time I hit the backspace, the damn presentation goes off the screen. So I learned that lesson uh, at Touricon. Um, the exploits that are uh, currently, we, was six? we have six exploits that are compiled and into the firmware by default already. Um, we, we plan on doing more, but we have been like slammed lately and haven't had a chance to go back. We, we released After we released the first version, we figured out we did some stuff that, that was kind of... I forgot what we added. We added something. Oh, oh yeah, we, the uh, Firuza US application wasn't part of the firmware at the time, so we finally added that into the firmware, just a couple minor things, and then re-released it. So we, we wanted to have another one out by the time we did this presentation, but it just wasn't in the cards for us. I mean, we just finished the presentation 10 minutes ago. So All the exploits are located in user SBIN, and you can list them in Firuza US. They just don't do anything yet. So it's like, oh man, I forgot the name of that and, and I'm too stupid to, you know, CD to user SBIN. I can go into Firuza US that's, and just hit show exploits and it'll show them. But it's actually going to do something in the future. So it's not just some lame list program. Um, things you probably shouldn't do with this firmware. This is the disclaimer section. Um, use Firuza US or Fox or, uh, I guess that's an old slide, um, as your main gateway. So if, if you have a, a, a a WRT at your house, and don't <laughs> take your Linksys firmware off and say, hey, I'm going to run this firmware instead. Which, I mean, that would be fine if you did, but just remember, if somebody compromises that or somebody finds some sort of way into it, now they have all the tools to attack your own networks and if your own passwords, all that stuff. Also, I'd like to add something. If you don't know how to use Telnet or SSH or TFTP, don't bother with our firmware. Um, we actually got a real email about that. Well, where's the Telnet command in Windows? Don't even bother. I w we will not answer emails like that. So, yeah, and, it's, and there's no, uh, the Windows admin that you, you'd see, there, the web admin, I should say, that you're used to seeing is totally gone. So it's, it's all command line. And, of course, Firuza US helps in some of that. So it helps if you know a little bit of the Nix commands. Um, and don't use this tool on systems that you don't own or have permission to test. 
I mean, this can be a really cool tool for doing pen tests and um, just proving how innocuous equipment can actually be used to own you. So it's, it's kind of cool in that regards, but on, on the other hand, um, if you're doing it to, like, your friends, well, that's still kind of funny, but not, not pretty, not legal. Um, okay, the future of Feruza WRT. Um, better documentation <laughs> seems to be our biggest, uh, our biggest lacking component. Um, our documentation sucks. So feel free to email us, you know, as long as it's not too bad. Um, there's a new, some new IPv6 attacks that uh, we're working on that we can't really uh, release yet. Um, more functions in Feruza US. That's coming. And if there's something that you'd like to see in the admin program, just send an email, and if it's not too bad, we'll just add it. Integration of more exploits. Oh, sorry. Integration of the exploits into the Feruza US, and that's just a matter of sitting down with some time, which we haven't had lately, and integrating them into the app. Um, net hack. <laughs> uh, that's purely for entertainment value. Um, and then we already talked about version 5 of the WRT, and hopefully they'll quit doing that so we can continue to develop this, because if nobody's going to use WRTs, then we're not going to maintain it, because nobody will be using it. All right. Uh, when firmware goes bad. Um, if, you, if you've messed around with any of the WRTs, uh, you'll notice that sometimes you mess with the firmware, and like any kind of firmware, sometimes things get brigged. Um, there's a couple things you can do to try to recover your WRT. Now, this, this would be no matter what uh, firmware you use, whether you use OpenWRT, Svsoft, anything like that. Sometimes shit just goes bad. So uh, here's a couple things you can try. All right, to avoid certain problems, there's an NVRAM variable called boot weight. And what that does is you turn that on, and when you first fire, fire up the, uh, the router for three seconds, its IP address will revert back to 192.168.1.1. Look at the slide for that. Um, so it will revert back to 1.1, and you can TFTP a firmware to it. Um, problems come when the firmware is over 3 megs. There's, there's other issues with that. But if you don't have boot weight on and there's a problem, then you really have a problem. So whenever you're starting to mess with custom firmware, like as soon as you go from the Linksys firmware to something else, make sure you set that NVRAM variable for the boot weight. Um, something else to try, which, oh yeah, sorry, it's been a while. Um, set up the computer to ping. That's not something else to try. That's actually part of the same procedure. So I think... Last year, it kind of screwed screwed us up because I think we we both talked on something separately. But it's really weird when you download the video later and you look how drunk you really were, and it's like you know you're out here talking, your eyes are all squinty. And now, I think I'm the only sober and non hungover one up here. It's a little different. Anyway, back to back on the farm. Um, you just set up the computer to ping that, that address. When it comes online, you push the firmware. The commands are there. It's not like you can do it right now or anything. So, um, You can hold in the reset button. Some people said they've gotten that to work. It's never worked on anything that, that we've done. Per have you ever seen it work? So I don't know. That may be just a myth. I have to check that out. You can try loading Svsoft, oddly enough. Um, Svsoft has been known to... Like, I don't know what they're doing different or what's going on behind the scenes, but sometimes if you have a brick WRT and you can actually push a firmware to it, if the firmware doesn't push properly, it doesn't take, if you try loading Svsoft, it starts to work. And then you can just go back in and, and upload your other firmware if you wanted to. Also, um, there, there's a URL here, uh, and it's void main as a geek, blah, blah, blah. And basically, he has, like, detailed pictures showing out how to short certain NVRAM pins on the NVRAM chip. Very dangerous, but it actually worked. I mean, we both successfully recovered WRTs that way. Um, sometimes you just get mad and you start like scraping all the, all the pins on the NVRAM. Um, and you can always pray to the gods of firmware. That doesn't work either. Okay. Here's a... Uh, Seven uses for a brick WRT, and we're actually going to finish on time, it seems like. Yes. They have a recovery firmware push? Oh. 
Wow, that's interesting. I'll definitely have to take a look at that. Um, usually, uh, TSA smashes mine into pieces, so they're beyond recovery at that point. Um, so here's seven uses for a brick WRT. And I'm sorry, the first one requires a demo, so my explanation is not going to be as funny as the actual demo. The WRT purse. And what that is, is it's a Cat 5, and it goes around your shoulder. And usually Gene models it, and he does a very good job at it. And uh, so that one's not very good. Um, the WRT soccer ball. The uh, WRT plastic surgeon. The WRT rap star. And I'm waiting for, I'm waiting for, I hope one day Ice Cube sees his face with a superimposed WRT on it. And my gimp, my gimp skills suck, so that's why it looks so horrible. Uh, the WRT lawn sprinkler. And the WRT pleasure device. All you need is a midget and a kazoo. I cannot wait till my boss sees this. All right. Now, are there any questions? Holy shit, we are damn good. No questions? Oh, there you go. Yes. Uh, I think there are people trying to, because that's a recent thing, I think there are people trying to figure out if it's version 5 by the serial number. There are some forums out there where, where people are talking about it. It's, it's rather hard. It doesn't say version 5 on the box, as far as I know. Yes. Um, that that must be a newer model. I mean, I'm I'm personally running version three, and I think that's when we bought a ton of them because we had like I think like ten of them when we were doing this development, and slowly but surely we kept having our supply um, smashed or broken or. Um, a miss soldered. <laughs> okay, we won't bring that up. But there was a, some soldering that went awry, and um, one ate the dust. So, any other questions? Yes, there are. The question was: Are there pre-Rev five versions of the Linksys WRT with the Cisco logo on? And that is correct. Yes, there are. I don't I don't know what their logic is for the move to um yeah VX works is what they're running now instead of Linux. Any other questions? Alrighty, thank you.